still near 12. Hello everyone, welcome to Dover's World. Thank God it's Friday and thank God I have here a very distinguished and fascinating guest, Obi Asika, who is, introduce yourself Obi. Hi, Obi Asika, Director General National Council for Arts and Culture, Nigeria. Okay, so Obi is like my cousin basically. I mean, we've been family friends forever. And um, I used to live with his mother, my son and I used to live with his mom. And he's not that much younger than me, but I see him as a junior brother. Um, so, his background, I think rather than tell you, I will ask him to tell you. Obi, you went to the most exclusive school in Europe, maybe in the world, Eton College, the same school that Prince William and Prince Harry went to in the UK. Tell us what it was like. Let's have a little background stuff. Eton, I had a great time at Eton. Um, Eton is a boys' school, 1,400 boys. I think in the sixth form, in my time in the sixth form, girls used to come for sixth form, but literally like 10 girls, right? So it's a boys' school, and like all boys' schools, are driven by specific things tradition, the societies, but most importantly, actually sports, you know, which is something that I, I, I feel really bad about in the Nigerian educational environment, when there's no compulsory sports in Nigerian schools, and Nigerian parents are not even concerned about that. And then at the same time, they're complaining about values. The only way you get values is sports, because sports teaches you how to win and lose, how to deal with dignity, and how to understand the difference between, you know, killing somebody because you lost, or you know, being down because you lost and just keep going. So for me, I mean, probably that's probably the most important thing we learned at Eton, and that you learn in school is the values. The fact that not every not everybody's an enemy. Not, the battle is not in the game, it's after the game. You shake the hand of the opponent, look them in the eye, congratulate them if they beat you. And if they if you beat them, you still commiserate with them. So just learning to be a gentleman and all those things. But yeah, it was interesting. Seven black boys, 1,400 boys. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, not many. Well, as they say, it's not whether you win or lose. It's how you play the game. 100%. And I think, you know, it's very clear. Well, I, I know you really well. So it's clear to me that you understand that concept. Are you saying that that concept, that mindset is lacking in Nigerian society? Obviously, that's why you have people doing do or die over the most basic things, whether it's politics, whether it's football, whether it's sports, whether it's even just in having an argument. It's so hard to find people being able to step back, have dignity. And, you know, it, it comes back to like, uh, you know, I'm not a, you know, I'm not like, like my sisters who are writers, but I'm, I'm reasonably literate. And my favorite poem has always been If by Rudyard Kipling when he says, if you can snatch, if you can deal with defeat and victory the same way, then you're a man. I saw yeah. my boy. It's very, very important. Absolutely. And um, you mentioned something interesting about being a racial minority at Eton. Um, obviously, in the United Kingdom, the United States, there are areas where black people are the majority or, the, you know, in, in schools mm -hmm. and in, in certain districts. But um, Eton being an exclusive white elite institution, essentially, you were in a minority. What was that like? I mean, people keep on accusing white people of racism in different countries, in different contexts. What, what was it like being well, one of, one of <laughs> what is it? What is it, seven, seven black boys out of 1,400? That's you, like minus 50% or something. 50%, forget <laughs> it. Well, not even, well, to be 10% would have been 1,140. Yeah, exactly. And we were seven, so one even 1%. Yeah. But, um, I, I mean, for me, and it's the same thing till now, um, black history is not on the agenda, black knowledge, Africa, never in the curriculum. So I think the first thing you learn and understand is I was blessed, right? Uh, my parents gave us a background and a knowledge base where we were extremely knowledgeable about who we were, where we're coming from. Um, nobody could ever talk down to me about being black. 
that's not been possible since I was born. In fact, I was more likely to be talking down to them because I was coming from a place where my parents really made us feel superior to everybody on the planet, black or white. <laughs> so we came in with a lot of attitude. Mm. The prep school I went to, I was the first black person in the prep school. Which one was that? Ashton House. The second per yeah. black person was my sister in mm. Kiru, who refused to go home at six years old and insisted she was going to follow her older brother. So uh, we've been dealing, and there was 130 kids with only two white kid, black kids. So we've been dealing with that all my life. And one of the things that made me realize from day one, which maybe my parents hadn't told me, that I was dealing, I was living and working in a white world. Which a lot of times, if you grew up in Nigeria, grew up in Africa, you don't realize the world is white. You may not even know you're black until you leave the continent and somebody tells you, hey, come here, you know, or whatever. So that is a, it has a big impact on you, but I think it was easy for, easier for us because we didn't have any complex. We couldn't be reduced. You have to be somebody that is able to be reduced because you don't see value in yourself to become a victim of racism. That's the way I see it. Well, what, I will interrupt you there because I have to tell you, mm -hmm. having also been to a white establishment elite boarding school in mm -hmm. the UK, um, that I have a very similar attitude to yours. Mm. But people get angry with me, black people and some white liberals as well, mm. because they say you're in denial, you're, you, are, you are incapable of seeing racism because you're blind, not because it doesn't exist. Oh, no, no, but I saw racism heavy. Okay. So my, mine is different. It's not that I didn't see it. Mm -hmm. I was a victim of it. Mm -hmm. There are many things that happened to me at school mm -hmm. where it simply didn't happen because I was black. Okay. Whether it's being supposed to be captain of certain things, in charge of certain things, there would be a way and a manner in which it was insidious, but it wasn't stated, but I knew that I understood that I'm black and okay. therefore they're not going to let me have this thing. Oh, wow. Simply, oh, definitely. And it's, it's the construct of the white world, the construct of white society, and I deconstructed it before I was 14. You see, you've never told me this, Obi, so this is something I'm learning for the first time. Because mm -hmm. in my school, I was a prefect, yeah, so and I. there was, um, the head girl in my year was a Ghanaian. Mm -hmm. We were very few too. I don't know, we went up to 10 black girls in my school, out of maybe four or 500. Mm -hmm. And we had a head girl who was, she, we voted. The head girl was selected mm -hmm. through voting, and of course, teachers yeah. had to approve the choice. So are you telling me that at Eton, there were certain things they wouldn't let you have for that reason? Oh no, look, it's like this, it's like, um, wow. the, the way I like to, I think, I think for me the core difference between the UK and the US, the UK, unless you're very, very lucky, you're not even going to know the rooms that you're not able to get into. Right. You know, in the USA, they're just not going to let you in, period. So it's not about... In the USA, you might you might become you will become CEO of a Fortune 500 company faster than you will in the UK if you're a black man. Mm -hmm. If you're a black woman who's less threatening, perceived to be less threatening, it'll work faster for you in the UK. So even coming out of univer coming out of um, public school, it was clear to me I could see my peers that were black males that were Nigerian or even British or whatever, their opportunities were reduced just by being black and male. Let the me women just, let being me just, black and female, they got easier opportunities faster. Let me just briefly explain to our American viewers, because we have quite a few, that um, when he says public school, in the UK, public school means private, private school. school. <laughs> so, um, definitely. And, and, and maybe, this is something a lot of people talk about as well, mm -hmm. is that black women are treated better than what black men. Oh, certainly. So maybe um, my experiences are not quite as, as polarizing as yours. No, I think the issue is, is it even treated better? Though perceived to be less threatening. Yes. A black man in the shadows on Thursday nights is not a pretty sight to a lot of people. It doesn't matter whether you went to Eton or you went to Brixton College. There's a black guy on the streets and you're big, you're a target, the police are going to stop you. I had a car in university, I was stopped every single day. What? And it, of course, I'm a black guy driving a car. I'm going to be stopped. It's not an if, but maybe situation. I will be stopped. I will be profiled. So by 18, 19, I'm already dealt with that. I mean, I had black American friends, African American used to tell me, once that boy gets to 16, there's a full lecture that has to be given about how to behave around police, how to behave, because otherwise you're going to get shot. The difference between England and America is, in England, you're not likely to get shot and killed. But in the States, if you step the wrong direction, the wrong way, 
as a black man and you're young, you could easily get yourself shot, killed, and nobody's going to come and say sorry. And as my old man used to say, not my father, but a retired colonel I used to know, and Enugu used to say, bullet no do here, sorry. You know, once they shot you, they shot you. Okay, so you talk about um, racism at school. Was it? Did you ever get the vibe from your fellow boys, or was it the older white people, like the teachers or whoever? Because I have to tell you, again, in my life growing up, all the white people were quite respectful. Maybe women are just nicer because if you're in a girls' school, you're surrounded by women. Yeah. Just, I mean, so I don't know. Tell me. Well, I, I think I think people react based on what they're used to. Um, in my in my prep school and at Eton, even at university, um, somebody from the north of England in Manchester or Liverpool at Eton was just as exotic as I was from Nigeria. Yes. <laughs> so. <laughs> In fact, I might even be speaking in English in an accent they can understand better than the Geordie that just showed up from Newcastle. Yeah. But um, bias is bias, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, and it becomes um, normalized when you see how society works. So the funny thing for me is that when I got to Eton, I was a very, to be fair, extremely arrogant 13-year-old when I arrived. Who says you're not arrogant now? I'm not arrogant at all. <laughs> now, I'm, now I'm just chill. But at 13, I was arrogant because as far as I was concerned, I mean, nobody sent me to Eton, right? Mm. Nobody, my father didn't go and look for a place at me at Eton. My headmaster at prep school called me when I was 10, asked me where I was going to go to school and put me down on the list to go down to that school and do an aptitude test. I had no idea what the school was. I was planning to go to school with my best friend who was going to go to a school called Marlborough. Mm -hmm. So I was going to go with him. Mm. And I was even mm. upset with my headmaster, like, why are you carrying me to this place? Mm. And he said to me, well, it's the number one school in the world. And I think you're at the level that that's where you should go. And to be honest, at that time, I considered myself the number one of everything. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, let's go. They humbled me because I got there <laughs> and I'm supposed to do like this academic thing. And you had to get 21 points mm -hmm. to get a place. I got 31, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Which meant I had a place comfortably, mm -hmm. but you had to get 35 to be a scholar. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was like, how am I not a scholar? You know, mm -hmm. this was like real mm -hmm. questions. Mm -hmm. And then he said to me, look, only 0.01% of people that ever take this thing get those numbers. Mm -hmm. And I was like, so what? I am the 0.01% <laughs> because I had that, that's the way we were raised. We're like, but I was also a serious athlete. Mm -hmm. So I was captain of like seven sports in school. So I'm like, okay. Are they any good at sports here? I remember you get you go to you get interviewed by the deputy headmaster because you're coming into the junior school when you come. I, but when I went in there, I was interviewing the man as if you know, why do you deserve to have me? You know, like if you're a football player looking to do a transfer, mm. and you go to talk to the manager and they say we want to buy you, I'm like, yes. What are your other plans? Mm, mm. Who else are you gonna buy? How are we gonna win the league? Mm. So I was busy grilling this man as if I was somebody. You know, I'm a. 12 and a half, 10 year old kid from nowhere. If I had been in Nigeria, he might have landed you a, oh, a beating oh, that's flap. <laughs> no, definitely. You'd have told my mother or father, who were nowhere to be seen at the time, mm. that ah, this is your son is cheeky and all these things. Yeah. But it was the way we're raised say mm. your mind, say what's on your mind. And you know, I thank God for that because we were taught to query everything. Right. Deconstruct everything. Mm -hmm. You can't teach me and tell me to go and repeat what you taught me in class. because That's not teaching. Mm -hmm. We're taught that you teach. I'll show you the thing, then go and put it together yourself and tell us what your perspective is. Mm -hmm. So you come from this fairly liberal, free-thinking environment uh, yeah. uh, that you were <laughs> educated in, and you come back to Nigeria where it's I call it borderline fascism, and then it doesn't. It, you know, people are not encouraged to think or to challenge ideas. Mm -hmm. um, everybody here almost has the same view about everything. It's a kind of crippling type of social orthodoxy and intellectual orthodoxy. And it's, it's fake. And it's fake. You think it's fake? Of course, it's fake. Go on. It's only like that for the camera, for the newspaper. You go and sit to the person and talk to them for real. And you get their real perspective. It's never the one they're projecting. Okay. Because yeah, because everybody's acting a part. They're acting a part. Ah, here, oh God, it's a part. So it's like, you know, I must be one of the few people in my age, or even in my status, or whatever, that's not moving around with a full entourage. 
the typical Nigerian might say, I will not come here by myself. I have six people outside. They have no job to do except stand and move and put, you know, guys come in and hail. And That's shout. true. You, know, you so, haven't come to my house with a, a hillox full of soul. No, I came with a hillox. That's my one car. Yes. <laughs> yes, it's not to so you. Don't, people but I, don't have, I don't have a 17 car convoy, no. Sure. But, but yeah. So, okay, so now you go back to London or to Europe regularly. Mm-hmm. Um, do you find that the, 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 has the landscape changed? In terms of racial profiling and all those things, um, I, I would say so. I mean, since we've even had someone, we've had a black president in America, we've had an Indian prime minister in the UK. I'd yeah. say things have changed a lot. What do you think? It's changed, but it hasn't. Okay. That's, what, that's what I would say. I would say that um, people of color, black people, Indian people, were much more central to every situation than we were 40 years ago. Right. Um, I was telling, I was speaking on Saturday at an event in Abuja to a bunch of young people in the tech and creative spaces. And as bad as they think, you know, a lot of young people, if you talk to them, everything they want to do is get out, right? Yeah. And everything is negative and there's nothing working on Nigeria. They don't want to leave Nigeria. And, yeah, Most of what, 90% of them. Yeah, Nigeria is terrible, this, that. I said to them, let me tell you something. This is the best time to be a Nigerian. If I was 21 and I'm Nigerian, this is a tremendous time to be a Nigerian. Oh. Oh, definitely. Let me tell you, when we were 21, ain't nobody knew anything about the Nigerians. Nobody was paying attention to the Nigerians. Nobody was talking about the Nigerians. In food, fashion, literature, music, sports, nobody. I don't care what anybody tells me, I'm old enough I was there. So 40 years ago, nobody knows the Nigerians great at football. Yeah. Nobody knows the Nigerians are incredible people across like 40 spaces. So what has happened is that, in spite of Nigeria, we have globalized. In spite of all the dysfunctions in yeah, society. in spite of our country, we've globalized. Mm-hmm. So the country has not been able to unlock the talent and capacity that we have, but we have found ways to do it. Whether, that, that speaks to a certain kind of dynamism, entrepreneurial spirit. Of course. Even if whether you're a musician or something else. Of I course. Mean, I mean, the kids... I remember, I'll give you an example. 2018, I was at Wembley Stadium. Whiskid was at the stadium as well. Nigeria was playing a friendly against England. Whiskid is a Nigerian pop star. Yeah, Whiskid is a, not just a Nigerian pop star, sold out stadiums in America and the UK. International. So he's a global star mm-hmm. living in London of mm-hmm. Nigerian descent. <laughs> mm-hmm. Or is Nigerian. But anyway, so Whiskid, 2018, he just done his first sold out show at. Um, at the O2, my nephew is his manager, and you know runs him. is an agent actually, not his manager. And he just done the show. I was at the show. This is like a, a weekend later or four days later. Nigeria playing England, last friendly before the World Cup in Russia. And a, fr- a friend of mine's son, um, sons, about four of these boys, the Nigerian boys, who are all Etonians, who are 15, 16, sitting a couple of rows in front of us. So the dad came and met me and said, listen, man, please, I need your help at half time. I'm like, what do you need? He says, my sons need a picture with whisk kid, man. <laughs> they can't stop going off. So I sorted it out. They took a picture with him. And these kids were so happy. And I told, I told their dad, you know, when we were their age, we didn't have a whisk kid. We didn't have anybody that anybody who we went to school with would care about. Yeah. Would want to know. Meanwhile, now we got the hottest artist in the UK all their boys in class are only looking for Whiskey or Burner Boy. Yeah. And there's Nigerian. The agency gives them, as Nigerians, you can't even buy it. What about Fela? There was Fela a was, Fela, was, Fela was not relevant in that way. In that way. Fela was in the, in the he was in the folk music, traditional folk. music thing. Africa. Yeah. No, not just in Africa, even globally. But you're not going to walk into the club on Friday night and hear Fela Kuti. Okay. We, we, we went for the jugular. Mm. The whole point about Afro beats was you're not going to call us world music. You're not going to put us at the back of the church, the back of the shop. I'm not interested. I know what this is. We want this and we have it now. And that's what we wanted and we took it. And it's not, and nobody gave it to us. Which and is it's even not, the most powerful thing. It's not just black kids in Europe, black kids in America, the Caribbean. It's white, Chinese, Indian. Everybody is interested in Nigerian Afrobeats. It is viral. Yeah. Because what it is, is we found our own emotional connect. That emotional connection is authentic, it's valid, it's not manufactured. 
So when we arrive, everybody knows the Nigerians have arrived. Mm-hmm. So when we enter the space, enter the room, it's not even just about the music, about the persona. This thing Nigerians call swag. Mm-hmm. It's in the DNA. Mm-hmm. And I tell people, I say, listen, no matter where you go on the planet, if I see a hundred black people, I'll point out all the Nigerians for you from a hundred meters. I don't need to get anywhere near them. Just by the way they're standing and looking, I'll tell you, those ones are Nigerian. They may be broke. Confidence. <laughs> they may be broke. But swag. they're Nigerian. The yeah. swag, the swag yeah. is deep, it's heavy. Yeah. yeah. My wife likes to say it's overweight. <laughs> a little bit like me. The swag is because it's in the DNA. It's it's who we are. Um, sometimes it's misplaced because we have confidence, we don't even know why we have the confidence. But it makes us unique and it makes it a situation that you can't deny us, you can't even avoid us. So yeah, to be a Nigerian, I think is a blessing and a curse. <laughs> that's, a, that's a rap line, I added up one later. <laughs> but it's a blessing. In fact, look, listen, when I was 2021, 20, right now, I mean, I, I give you easy numbers. There are 100 African players in the NFL, 80 are Nigerian. And you can mirror that in the NBA, okay, in the EPL. Sure. And guess what? Nigeria did not plan for one of those people. Do you get what I'm saying? They so, weren't grouped. No, they, look, it's like Afrobeats. What plan did Nigeria have to? There was no plan. So what has happened is the natural talent, ability, energy, capacity, and attitude of the Nigerians is manifesting everywhere. Which is why my work is about unlocking and tapping into that energy, which is what I've been doing all my life anyway. So exactly. what you're seeing is for the first time, perhaps the Nigerian government has understood that this thing that we Nigerians have is not just special, it is unique, it has value, it makes money. So now we're trying to get the resources to enable us to fully unlock the space. Because... Well, stop that's right the there thing. because... Good. We were, I was going to move on to your career. <laughs> Let's, well, just, I want to ask you one question first before we move on to your life's mission, the work you've been doing and the work you're doing now. Okay, so what qualifies what some people would call a coconut? That is a, a black boy who's someone who's black on the outside, but a little bit white inside because he's had a white establishment education. What qualifies you to come back to Nigeria and represent Nigerian arts and culture? Because I've never been a coconut. Okay. Never, ever. I'm black to the... Listen, I'm a black radical. Okay. Raised by a man who's followed the Black Panthers by a woman who was playing drums on TV for the Black Nationals, the precursors of Black Panthers. Mm-hmm. I read Malcolm X before I was 10. I love Angela Davis, yeah, by the way. That's, that, I mean, that's, I come from a line of that. Mm. So even if I'm in England, or I'm sitting with my white friends, mm. they will tell you mm. from till they know me till tomorrow, that one, mm, no, but, no, no. but still, Obi, mm-hmm. there are people who would say you are not typically Nigerian or African. How can I be typically Nigerian or African when I come around from? So I understand. So you do have the legitimacy of Nigerian citizen, you have a vision, you have a love for your people um, while recognizing their shortcomings. So, but have you, did you find it hard to slot in no. to the Nigerian society? Because I was never away from it. Okay. All right. The, every, my, par- my parents never let me be away from this country up to two years at a time. Yeah. So in 15 years outside the country, in fact, the first 10 years, every single holiday, I had to come back. I used to think it was like punishment. I'm like, why do I have to be? I said, my friends are going here for summer. Uh, you're going to Enugu. Any... <laughs> my friends are going here. My friends are going to Switzerland. You're going to Enugu. Any... Yeah. Uh, they're going to Enugu. Any... To the extent I started looking forward to going to Enugu, any... mm. I didn't even want to come to Lagos, to be honest. Because Lagos was just traffic. As a teenager, you're like, why would I stop in Lagos? I spent two nights in Lagos. What for? I'm going to Enugu. Any... The fine babes are in Enugu, the green grass is in Enugu. I don't need any stress in this Lagos. So for me, I understand what you're saying. Definitely, hey, look, even my accent will tell you I'm not the regular Nigerian. But it just means to me that you can't sell me, you can't fool me. I've seen it. Well, my, my view is that actually it doesn't do any society any harm to have inputs from people who are not typical. And what I'm even saying is, it's not even just that, what I'm saying is this. A lot of times the things that make me laugh times is that sometimes I watch my country make moves. I see people run around. And who are they running around? They're running around my classmates, right? It's a form of reverse racism. You're running around my classmates. Because I'm black and I'm sitting here with you, you don't realize that it's the same person. Mm. So who is Boris Johnson? Who is David Cameron? 
right? They're two so years well, above me in school. Okay, so you were at school with Boris Johnson and David Cameron. And many, many others. British Prime Ministers. Yeah, Rec yeah. Recent British Prime Ministers. Yeah, so, but the thing is, so if Boris comes here, he will look for me. <laughs> I mean, he came here last year. Actually, I have one picture with him. I didn't post it. Because I'm like, Boris is so deeply unpopular. I don't need to be taking any of his heat. But the well, his book is number one in the best-selling well, it would charts be. right now. But actually. it would be. You know, he's brilliant. You know, he's, yes. he's an academic scholar. He writes yes. very well. He has a great story to tell. And half of what he does is a wind-up anyway. But when he came here, people were rushing up to him to take selfies. So I went up to him and I said, hi. He's like, what are you doing here? And I said, you're in Nigeria, mm -hmm. man. <laughs> what do you mean? I should be asking you, what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. And he took the selfie, right? Which, by the way, he still hasn't sent to me. But other people took pictures of him taking the selfie. And so people were asking me, those who have seen the picture, like, why is he taking the selfie with you? I said, because he's known me since I was eight. It's not an if, but, maybe. Mm -hmm. But the thing about it is, in this country, there are many of us like that. There are many Nigerians who have been embedded in some of the biggest schools in the world and the universities. But how has Nigeria used them? Does Nigeria use them? Nigeria, does Nigeria lean into that access, that network, that capacity? No. I would say we don't. So I'd even go so far as to say, whether you agree with me, I don't know, you can tell me. I go so far as to say that Nigerians who are cosmopolitan and have international exposure and contacts are often resented rather than regarded as an asset who can bring the country or a particular organization up. Of course, of course. It, depend, it depends on who's in power at the time. Mm. If they see you as you have enjoyed and your time has yes. happened, yes. Then, then yes, that's the case. But if it is somebody who is strategic and understands the value that you can bring to the table. Mm. So if I'm sitting with you and I say, instead of me calling somebody at CNN, I can call you that knows 20 people at CNN. Mm. Instead of me doing a cold call, it would be only intelligent for me to call you. I say, mm. don't know, please, I need to talk to your people. Mm -hmm. So I just look at it like, how are you utilizing the assets you have as a country? And as a country, sadly, we're still not really fully utilizing our global networks and capacity. And it's not just in the UK or the USA, it's in Asia, it's in Russia, it's in India, it's in Singapore. Because guess what? If you keep going around the world and you check what the Nigerians have been doing, the Nigerians do amazing things everywhere. They do. And it's just about being given access and capacity, not capacity, but access and opportunity. Capacity normally is within the person anyway, but you have to invest into that capacity to bring it out. Mm -hmm.